I'm Matilda, and in 33, I'm going to go to Silk. This is the first time in the history of Scotland that there's been a debate in the Scottish Parliament about the school starting age. It would be a big change and I understand why some people are nervous about it. Scotland's school starting age has been with us since 1870. It is deeply ingrained in our culture, in our habits and in our expectations. It's not about putting off learning until children reach primary three. Attending school would still be mandatory. It is about transforming how children learn in what is currently P1 and P2. There was a school of thought that the sooner children start formal learning, literacy, numeracy, testing different abilities, the quicker they will progress through the curriculum and that it will be to their advantage. Actually, the evidence says completely the opposite and that children need at least the first six to eight years to really just find themselves. That, that is the time that they're growing into their bodies, so they need a lot of physical play, a lot of freedom to be outside in nature doing what comes naturally to them. And that's not wasting time, that's giving them time. 12% of the world starts school before the age of six, and the overwhelming majority of those are ex-members of the British Empire, due to the fact that back in the 1860s, the government was deciding to when to introduce universal state education. Um, and they went for four or five, um, not because of any educational reasons, but because they wanted to get their children off the streets. Uh, because their mothers had to go to work in the mills and the mines and the factories. Totally economic, not educational or uh, child welfare reasons really at all. When you talk to teachers they will tell you that there definitely seems to be uh, much, uh, many more children with poor mental health at the moment than, than when they started their careers. If we changed the whole approach to early years education, it would have great gains for um, society and for um, the population in, in general. The hope would be that children would have a greater appreciation for the outdoors, children would have a greater um, degree of managing risk, they would have developed better relationships and appreciation of uh, things around them and be far, far more aware. And the benefits would be that we would have a fairer society, um, a society that met the four capacities of uh, curriculum for excellence, successful learners, confident individuals, responsible citizens and effective contributors. And if we were to manage that um, through a change in approach to the early years, um, I think that would be really successful. So we've known for a long time, for decades, even centuries, that play is important for children's learning. It's the way they connect with the world, they learn about themselves and how to be in the world. But in more recent times, because of developments in neuropsychology and um, advancements in uh, brain studies, we've learned that play is more fundamental than that because it's actually essential for children's health and well-being. Probably it's not an understatement to say it's as important as sleep and nutrition and connection with nature. Not just in childhood, but for what happens thereafter. There's a complete misunderstanding or a misinterpretation of what play means in the sense of a play-based approach. Um, you know, I think there's a general perception, especially amongst those who are not in the profession, that uh, play is something quite frivolous and unimportant. But I think, um, you know, there's a famous quote about play as a child's, child's work, and that is absolutely right. And so, you know, a lot of their education and a lot of their uh, learning is, is through play, 
you know, both both unstructured play and structured play, of which there has to be, you know, a, a good balance. Um, but we really have to convince people that um, play is education and play is um, a very, very serious um, part of children's work. Play has been described as a protective shield against adversity. It's only through play that you learn how to deal with risk and disagreement and negotiation and all those sorts of things. So children need to play and to build up um, attributes of competence and confidence, autonomy and resilience. And they do that through their play, especially through physical play, play in nature and through creative doing. So things that they do with their hands repetitively, like craft, art, drama, painting, all those sorts of things have been shown now to, to really endow children with the sort of skills they need to deal with difficulties later in life. Really, if, if, we, if our goal is for children to become educated, and to become creative learners and doers, then it's all the more important that they take the time that, they're, that they have to build and grow their bodies before they start sitting at a desk, looking at worksheets and writing without playing as much as they need to. It takes it takes them away from the work that they cannot go back and do later. They have to do in, in these early years, building their brain, building their organs, building their bodies, sense, integrating all their senses so that when they come and actually, actually are ready for desk work, they're not still struggling with distraction, dis difficulties and inability to be still and listen and focus, which is really a setback, actually, in the bigger picture. So the early level part of Curriculum for Excellence is very much steeped in a play-based approach. Unfortunately, presently, there's a great drive uh, in terms of raising attainment and closing the gap. The tension created is that in schools we are concerned at the moment with uh, reaching certain uh, attainment levels by a certain stage but that doesn't necessarily fit with a developmental approach because what's happening is that children um, are being expected to progress in literacy and numeracy when developmentally they're not at that stage yet and if we lifted the barrier, the attainment barrier, um, to create and to um, present a more play-based approach. Um, we certainly think that children would be far more uh, rounded and um, would be in a position to acquire literacy and numeracy skills um, at a time when they are cognitively ready. As soon as you start bringing in tests, you change that, that child-led, uh, interest-driven, active learning culture and environment into something more measured that can be stressful for the teachers, it can be stressful for the children and the parents. I think that the, the, the other barriers is that we need to create a big culture change I think that we need to have everyone uh, buying into it. I think we, have, we need everyone to be um, fully aware of the benefits of a developmentally um, age-appropriate curriculum, which would um, also enhance not only um, children learning literacy and numeracy when it's age and stage appropriate, but also adding to their health and well-being.
the, the really frustrating thing is that we, you know, the countries that are doing the best tend to be countries like Finland, Estonia, Switzerland, where children don't start formal education till seven. And the one that really fascinates me at the moment is Ireland, because back in 2008, the Irish um, introduced a new early years curriculum up to the age of six, very much like the sort of thing you'd see in, in the, the Nordic countries. Um, no reading and writing or anything, it's, it, it's all oral language and learning and play. And um, interestingly, the children that went through that curriculum were the ones who sat for the last PISA. And the, um, they've shot up the literacy charts. What you do in early years pays off. We still need happy water because that's the only thing that will help you. I think it would be, I think it would be very advantageous if we um, were to be quite bold and quite imaginative, and to introduce a kindergarten stage, um, perhaps up to the age of between six and seven. What I'd quite like to see, and what I think would be beneficial for the children and their development and their learning, would be a, a model that's very similar to nursery, where ages and stages are mixing, where there's free flow, where there's lots of. Um, outdoor sessions, um, in fact the predominance of outdoor sessions, out in the fresh air, um, learning how to self-regulate, developing relationships um, and also um, creating time for the children to develop appropriately uh, to reach a stage where they're actually ready to, to um, acquire literacy and numeracy skills. not much more. When I was five, I was just alive. But now I'm six, I'm as clever as clever, so I think I'll be six forever and ever.